challenges to our faith and to help to gain some answers to those challenges. And as we gather together now and consider one of those challenges, I pray that you'll give us ears to hear and eyes to see, and I pray that you'll give us clarity of thought and the ability, Lord, to be able to receive and also to uh, grasp it in such a way that we can give answers, reasons for faith as we talk to people in the world and also to other Christians who deal with these issues. So we thank you and we praise you for your goodness, for your grace. Bless now as we gather together in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn in your Bibles this morning to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. This is where we're going to take our reading from this morning. We're not going to do a, an expositional study from this passage. We're just using it as a springboard to get in to our topic today. This is what we call Reasons for Faith Sunday, where every couple of months we take a break from the study that we have been involved in. In, this, in our case, uh, we've been going through the Gospel of Matthew. Take a break from that and address an issue uh, that is really a challenge to the Christian faith and how we can respond to it as believers uh, from the Word of God. So this is one of those Sundays, and we're going to be talking about the philosophy of situation ethics. How many of you have ever heard of situation ethics before? Raise your hand. Okay, and those of you who haven't, you're in for, I think, some great enlightenment today, all right? Because situation ethics today pretty much governs the way the world operates, all right? For the most part, it's pervasive. It has effect, infected, affected, and infected just about everything that the world does in the name of what they call goodness, okay? So we're going to be dealing with that subject today. And uh, as to start it off, I want to give you an ethic that is not situational, it is divine, it's from heaven, it's God's will for us. This is the biblical ethic that we need to be living by. Okay, so Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 to 17, I'll read the first and the odd-numbered verses, and you guys can join together in reading the even-numbered verses. Let's stand as we read together, okay? And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You have no other gods before me, or you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, nor do any work, nor any man with his hand, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. You shall not murder. 
You shall not steal. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor his iPad, (laughs) nor anything that is your neighbor's. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Again, speak to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Human beings throughout history have been tempted by a desire to be freed from the dictates of higher authority. Most people want to be free to do whatever they want to do. This attitude ran like crazy among the baby boomers whose uh, formative years occurred during the 1960s when I grew up. Expressions that were commonplace at that time included things like, do your own thing, let it all hang out. The ideas of free sex and drugs and the idea of drop in and drop out was very common. These these simple slogans offer, I think, significant insight into what really was driving the countercultural forces at that time. Underneath the stated objectives of love and peace and brotherhood were the actual motives of self-indulgence and freedom from restrictions. Young people in my generation didn't want to be told anything, and they didn't want to be responsible for anything. And so not surprisingly, this ethical, moral, and spiritual perspective has spread like gangbusters, and now pretty much dominates the American moral landscape in the 21st century. And there are some in the church today who are also going down a similar path, albeit under the guise of a desire to do God's will and to save souls. In an effort to make the gospel more appealing, they are relaxing doctrinal rigidness or de-emphasizing standards that are clearly biblical and necessary. Could it possibly be that those who seek to relax doctrinal rigidity, are in reality implementing their own agenda of change simply to relieve themselves of the biblical restrictions? Is it purely coincidental that the permissive preachers have been both willing and eager to accomplish or to accommodate the clamor of the no-negative all positive preaching. One of the things that I hear a lot today in Christian circles is we want to be known for what we're for, not for what we're against. And I, my response to that is, why? The Bible is clearly for things, but it is also clearly against things. So what I want to be known for is what the Bible wants to be known for, and it's both. So it's not an either-or proposition, it's a both-and. Is it it completely accidental and unrelated that many voices today are saying that it's no longer important to obey the commands of Scripture? Because, after all, we are under law. We're, We're under law, not grace. And or we're not under law, but we're under grace, and we have freedom in Christ. No, these, these circumstances are not coincidental. They're not unrelated. I believe they are calculated, and they are conspiratorial. Those in the world who don't like the law have infected the church with the idea that guilt is destructive. 
They say that being concerned for others is really a form of codependency. The new catchphrases are, God wants me to be happy. And it meets my needs. And here's one that is really pervasive. I need to follow my heart. But these are driven by nothing more than selfish attitudes that make my desires more important than being a responsible member of society and being a follower of Jesus Christ. Many have rewritten the Ten Commandments in this quest. That's why I started off with the Ten Commandments. To become freer and less restrained. Thou shalt not commit adultery ordinarily. Thou shalt not steal, usually. Thou shalt not bear false witness, unless it will make life easier for me or somebody that I love. Thou shalt not covet my neighbor's possessions, unless, of course, he has something that I want. And by the way, he already has more than he needs, so it's okay for me to take what's his, because he doesn't really need it anyways. In a book written in 1966 called Situation Ethics, The New Morality, which, by the way, that ought to clue us immediately that there's something wrong with it. A new morality? Do we need a new morality? You mean God's established morality isn't good enough? No, we need a new morality. Situation Ethics, The New Morality, written by liberal theologian and professor Joseph Fletcher. He advocated these very ideas in this book. Fletcher was ordained as an Episcopal priest, but then later identified himself as an atheist. And I submit to you that if you adopt these ideas of situational ethics, then it eventually has to lead you to uh, either agnosticism or atheism. Because you can't believe in the God of the Bible and still hold these particular views. So it eventually, in his case, left, uh, led him to becoming an atheist. He was a leading academic proponent, proponent of the potential benefits of abortion, infanticide, euthanasia, eugenics, and cloning. Did you get that? Did you, did you hear that? The potential benefits of abortion, infanticide, euthanasia, Eugenics, of course, we know what abortion is, right? What is infanticide? It's killing babies, which is what many people are propagating today um, in allowing abortion right up to the day of the, the birth of the child. And many people now are saying, well, if we can abort up to the, the moment that the child is to be born, then we ought to use the same reasoning to after the, within the first year of the child's life. If the child is portraying something that is a hassle for us to have to deal with, then we should be able to abort during that period of time too, using the same reasoning. Because life is going to be tough on me if I have to raise this child. Of course, uh, euthanasia is what they call mercy killing. And eugenics... You know what eugenics is? Eugenics is altering um, you know, human DNA so that we only get desirable characteristics. You know, if there is anything undesirable that we don't want, essentially it's, it's the science of basically building supermen. We genetically eliminate these you know, propensities toward this, this uh, condition or that condition. Um, it's, 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 it's what Hitler was doing when he was trying to uh, eliminate anything what, that society considered bad in the human race. And then, of course, cloning is another one. So he was, he was for these things. He, he thought that there were potential benefits in all of them. And he's not the only one, but, but he is one of the most prominent. The truth is, situation ethics goes all the way back to Eden, 
at the Garden of Eden, when Satan posed to Eve circumstances that he alleged would justify setting aside the commandments of God. His basic argument was, hey, if you want to be like God, and who doesn't? And you want to know the difference between good and evil, and we should, right? Then you can break the command not to eat the apple. After all, wouldn't it be a good thing to know the difference between good and evil? Wouldn't it be good to be like God? Seems like it would be. You see, Fletcher believed that we need to shake loose infantile dependence on laws and systems of morality. He believed that we need to decide moral issues situationally and learn to sin bravely, as he put it, so that we can live as free men. He said, and, and notice, notice the terminology here, he said that agape love, which he defined as unconditional love, is the key to right action, even if that action per se is sinful. Here's a quote. Lying could be more Christian than telling the truth. Stealing could be better than respecting private property. No action is good or right in itself. It depends on whether it hurts or helps people, whether or not it serves one's love's purpose, understanding love to be a personal concern in the situation. Many at the time responded to this new ethic with great enthusiasm and applause. And it's no wonder since Jeremiah declares that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. Many young people bought into this moral deterioration, and some older ones as well. It's always tempting to take the easy way out. It's always tempting to rationalize my own moral deterioration by saying that what I am really doing is actually a more modern, more relevant approach to religion. Fletcher's argument is what you might call a sophism. The dictionary has an appropriate definition for the sophism employed by Dr. Fletcher. Here it is. Sophism, an argument used for deception, disputation, or the display of intellectual brilliance. An argument that is correct in form or appearance, but is actually invalid. That's Dr. Fletcher and his situation ethics. So let's, let's look at this. You, you keep, you, you, some of you are looking at me like, what is situation ethics? You still haven't explained it yet. Okay, I'm going to explain it right now. The teachings of situation ethics. Just who is this man, Joseph Fletcher, and what does he believe? Not from the opinions of his critics, but as he states in his own writings. So again, a little background. Joseph Fletcher was born in 1905, and later he worked as a coal miner, a laborer in a rope factory, a social worker, and a college chaplain. For 27 years, he was professor of social ethics at the Episcopal Theological School in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Later, he taught ethics at the University of Virginia Medical School. Harvey Cox, in a book called The Situation Ethics Debate, calls him a spokesman for social Christianity grounded in essential piety. After Fletcher's situation ethics, the new morality appeared in 66, he, he followed it up the next year by a book called Moral Responsibility. And knowing what you know at this point about Fletcher, uh, we can probably figure out that that's not one that we want to use as a guideline for how we should behave morally, right? But the former, in the former book, his position about situation ethics is stated clearly, and, and this is it in a capsule. First, he discusses three approaches to ethics. At one extreme is legalism, which he identifies as any system that gets its authority from a rule book such as the Bible. 
at the opposite extreme, so that's us. He, he considers us the extreme. At the opposite extreme is what is called antinomianism, which has no rules. So, you know, there's, there's the groups that have rules and there's the group that have no rules. And examples of antinomianism are uh, libertinism, which is a way of, of living devoid of most moral principles, responsibility, sexual restraints, and existentialism, which is the view that humans define their own meaning in life. But then he says right in the middle, and then presumably because it's in the middle, it's the best, it's balanced, is what he calls situationalism. It is not, he insists, existential, because it uses our heritage and our moral judgment, and it uses love as guidelines. Second, he states, some presuppositions of situation ethics using philosophical terms. Fletcher says that situation ethics involves pragmatism. You know, what seems good at the time because it lets the present situation guide. It also involves relativism, because one must never say never, and always, or perfect, or absolute. And there's, you know, there's a little bit of truth in some of these things, right? So this is why it's deceptive. Don't ever say never. Nothing is ever always, right? We understand that, especially when it comes to arguing with each other. You know, when we, when we pose an argument with somebody uh, that is, you know, annoying us, we say, you always do this. You husbands and wives, you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's just, it's never good to, to, to categorize things as always or never. Because nothing is ever always or never, except, except heaven is always going to be a good place to be. That's a, that's a good always, Right? But, but it involves positivism because at its heart is the positive declaration that love is the key category for conduct. Although it cannot be proved that that is the case. Uh, also, one must ask the definition of love. Whenever you say love is the guiding factor, then what, what kind of love are you actually talking about? You need a definition of that. And then it also involves what is called personalism, because people, not things, are of primary importance. And I, you know, I, can, I can agree with that too. People are more important than things. Most of us can agree with that. So there's, there's a little bit of truth in some of these things that he is, he is advocating, right? Third, and this is the heart of his creed, he states the propositions that serve as principles to guide situational ethic conduct. And here, here's, the, here's the, the, the principles. He says, the first principle is that love is the only thing that is intrinsically good. Love is the only thing that is intrinsically good. He says, this is agape love, and it is the only good thing that is. That's interesting. We could... Rest on that one for a while. Talk about that one at great length. But that's, that's his first principle. The second principle, the ruling norm for Christian decision is love. Third, love and justice are the same because justice is love using its head. I don't have a, really an argument with that either. Fourth, love is not necessarily the same as like. Because love wills the neighbor's good whether we like him or not. Again, I can see some truth in that statement, right? So love is impartial. Fifth, only the end justifies the means. Nothing else. Did you get that? You know, we always, not always, but you know, says we've got to be careful about using that word always, right? <laughs> But we are familiar with the phrase, the end does not justify the means. But it's the opposite with situation ethics. The end does 
justify the means. That's his fifth principle. In fact, he says nothing else justifies the means but the end. Of course, the end is love, but he argues that a loving end justifies any means, including, he says, lying, adultery, stealing, and murder. However, Fletcher says that we need to ask four questions about an action in order to sort of sanctify the means used. First of all, what is the end desired? What are the means that will achieve that end? What is the motive for using those means? He says it should be responsible love. And then finally, what are the foreseeable consequences of taking this course of action? Answering these questions will place some restraints on the means that are used. But then we must determine what a good end is. And so love makes a decision then and there in the situation about what a good end is, what a good end should be. So then a sixth principle is that love is not specific, but it's situational. However, it seems that the very existence of the first five propositions contradicts the sixth. Hasn't Fletcher given us precepts to be followed in any situation before the situation arises? He's given us some very specific things that define what love is, but then he tells us love is not specific, but situational. Hasn't he said that love is our guiding principle in everything that we do? And if he has, then how can he say that love is defined at the moment a decision is made, since it's not specific, but situational, based on the situation? The sixth proposition actually seems to make the first five unnecessary, or the first five make the sixth impossible. Of course, Fletcher would say that these rules or principles really don't have any value in and of themselves, but instead they are just guidelines to guard our behavior so that it will be helpful in any particular situation. <laughs> Sounds like double talk to me. Sounds like I'm being sold a bill of goods here. He gives principles or rules to guide us, but then he says we don't really need to, to let them constrain us since the situation will guide us. Joseph Fletcher then illustrates his new morality almost convincingly. Perhaps Fletcher's best-known illustration is Mrs. Bergmeier. How many of you know Mrs. Bergmeier? You're about to meet her. Mrs. Bergmeier. Bergmeier. Mrs. Bergmeier was a German who was captured by the Russians and taken off to a prison camp in the Ukraine. Her husband, who had been previously captured, he was a German, obviously, they were both Germans, right? Her husband had been previously captured by the Allies and, and who spent time in a POW camp in Wales. He was eventually, at the end of the war, he was returned to his home in Berlin. And after much searching, he located and was reunited with his three children, but the whereabouts of the mother remained a mystery. Remember, she was being held by the Russians. So they didn't, they didn't let go of their POWs uh, so quickly. Meanwhile, Mrs. Bergmeier learned that her family was together and was searching for her, but the only way that she could leave the camp was either for medical reasons which if she had some medical issues, then she would only be transferred to a Soviet hospital, or she could leave if she got pregnant, in which case she would be returned to Germany. Apparently the Russians didn't want to have to deal with pregnancy and the children that came from that. So she thought about her situation, and then she finally asked a friendly guard to impregnate her, which he did. And so she became pregnant, returned to her family, who welcomed her with open arms, even after she told them how she had managed to gain her freedom. 
And so as the story goes, the family loved baby Dietrich more than all the rest since he had done more for them than anybody. Fletcher calls Mrs. Bergmeier's act, he calls it sacrificial adultery. Because she loved her family so much, which was the motive, that she was willing to commit adultery, the means, not sinful in this case, to be reunited with them, the end, desirable in this case. So the end justifies the means. The motive was love, the means was adultery, and the end was reuniting with family. See? A happy ending. So the end justifies the means. Or he gives another illustration, the story of a Christian girl who was asked by American intelligence to prostitute herself in the interests of gaining information from the enemy. The basis on which she was approached was this. This is the reasoning used to justify this. If your brother who fought in the last war risked his life for his country, why cannot you give at least your body for your country? These are thought-provoking situations, and they cause some to consider, do the biblical rules really apply to our modern society? Is not a situation ethic really more loving and just? Next, let's consider some problems. We, you, you know, some of them are self-evident to us because of, uh, you know, our, our moral framework that we live our lives by. But let's consider some of them. A basic problem with situation ethics is that it doesn't give proper place to a living God who has spoken and acts in history concerning the affairs of men. It doesn't give any, any place to God in working out some of these problems. It fails to take into account the Bible's claim that the central concern of man is to love, honor, glorify, and obey God. That's the central concern of man. Fletcher says almost nothing about this part of human responsibility. Instead, he focuses pretty much all of his attention on love for my fellow man. This isn't to say that those who hold these views don't have any kind of God in their system. Some do. But it is to insist that they have discarded the true God, the God of the Bible, who has revealed himself in the Bible, and they have substitute, really, a God of their own making, who is essentially just like them. The God of the situationalist cannot be the supernatural, transcendent being that's revealed to us in the scriptures. And while love for fellow man is certainly crucial to our way of living and treating others and is absolutely necessary for the Christian, it must be viewed in its rightful position. It must be placed beneath the greater, higher responsibility of loving God. You can't love God without loving your neighbor. That's true. But theoretically, you could love another person without loving God. Consequently, our love for fellow man must be viewed in the larger framework of focusing one's life on pleasing God first and foremost. Since this must be the singular, all-consuming passion for all of us, we then have to look at the Word of God to determine how to love God and fellow man. In other words, to comply with the number one responsibility in life, which is to love God, we must consult the absolute prefabricated, prescriptive, iron-bound do's and don'ts of Scripture. This, by definition, is love for God. 1 John 5.3 says, For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. It follows, then, that Fletcher is wrong in identifying the only intrinsic good as love for fellow man. According to the Bible, intrinsic good includes love for others, 
But coming before even love for others is love for God. Matthew 22, 36 to 37. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Consequently, God is the one who defines what love entails in man's treatment of both God and his fellow man. And those definitions are found in the Bible in the form of prescriptive rules, regulations, and yes, ironclad do's and don'ts, and they are not based on circumstances or situations. But if you redefine God and make him into a being of your own imagination, then everything changes. In other words, when one changes and thus rejects the God of the Bible, then one's ethics change too. One's belief of what is right and wrong changes. When you redefine God, you also redefine morality. This permits Mrs. Bergmeier's family and friends to say that she did a good and a right thing. The second fundamental flaw of Fletcher's brand of situationalism is the subtle redefinition of the word love. While Fletcher agrees that love is, is more an active decision of the will than an emotion, which I agree with as well, his idea of love is really materialistic and secular rather than scriptural and spiritual. Love to Fletcher is what human beings decide is good or is best in a given situation. This humanistic approach allows man and his circumstances to become the criteria for defining morality rather than allowing God to define the boundaries of moral behavior. Rather than doing the right thing and then letting God determine how things end up, we're supposed to gauge how things might end up or how things might turn up out and then determine what is right and wrong based on that. But the Bible simply doesn't place moral rightness and love on opposing sides of each other. In fact, according to the Bible, one cannot love either God or fellow man without law. The only way for an individual to know how to love is to go to the Bible and to discern their the specifics of what is loving behavior. When Paul declared in Romans 13.10, love is the fulfillment of the law, he did not mean that it's possible to love one's neighbor while getting rid of the law. He didn't mean that at all. In other words, love and law are not opposing each other. Instead, he meant that when you conduct yourself in a genuinely loving manner, you are automatically acting in harmony with the law, i.e. you're not killing, you're not stealing, you're not coveting, you're not bearing false witness. God in his laws defined and pinpointed how to love. To treat any of God's laws as optional, flexible, or occasional is to undermine the very foundations of love. Notice that when the Lord gave the two greatest commandments, he gave them as two separate statements. Love the Lord your God was one, and then love your neighbor. The situationalist has made them read, you shall love the Lord your God by loving your neighbor. See, by stating it this way, he cleverly takes the attention away from the first command and he focuses it on the last, the second one. Although, really, the Lord said the first command was the greatest of them all. This is the, this is the heart of the problem with situation ethics. There really is no vertical dimension to it. It's all horizontal. Ethics is related to the horizontal, to the neighbor, to the situation, to the circumstances. When God is no longer supernatural, he can be eliminated. If he is not supernatural, 
His laws can be ignored. And a God like this doesn't intervene in, in a man's life. So the choices that one faces in a particular situation never need to include the possibility of the miraculous or God's intervention in the situation. Neither do they need to include the concept of sacrifice in the will of God. And so Mr. and Mrs. Bergmeier did not have to consider the option that the living and loving God could open the prison doors in some other way. Or that the option that separation or even martyrdom might actually be for the glory of God. They couldn't conceive of that because their God was not a God who could conceive of that. And this is the basic fallacy of situation ethics. In situation ethics, God is not supernatural. His word is meaningless. His interaction in lives today is impossible. Another problem concerns what Fletcher calls agape love, which is the key to his new morality. Situationalists di I define their agape love as loving the unlovable. And again, we would say that's a good thing, loving the unlovable, right? But the Bible defines it not as loving the unlovable. It could be included in it, but that's not the definition. The Bible defines it as that quality of God himself that is given to man only through the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. Romans 5.5 5 says, Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Now isn't it interesting that Fletcher would use a biblical term such as agape love, which is what the Bible defines as God's love for us, and then reject the God and the commands of that God who gives that love to us through the self-sacrifice of his son for our sins, though we are undeserving. He uses the biblical term for God's love and then he rejects God. Since situation ethics agape love is really human, it will inevitably inevitably be tinged with hypocrisy and dishonesty, which are built-in factors in any human love. This would mean that hypocrisy is built in. It's actually part of the very nature of this agape that Fletcher proposes. If telling the truth could lead to a bad outcome for me or somebody else, then I must lie. If uh, you know, if anything that God tells me to do will lead to what I conceive to be a bad income, then I must not do what God has told me to do. In other words, human agape love, with human agape love, dishonesty is absolutely necessary if I hope to get the right outcome. The reality is it's not agape love at all because it's not self-sacrificing, but it's selfish and self-centered. The Bible offers a solution to this problem, though. The fruit of the Spirit is love. That's the agape. That's the true agape love. But in order to have this love, one must be born again by the Spirit of God. But the necessity to be born again is not part of of the theology of this new morality. And so the very key needed to be able to love in this way can't be had because the person who alone can give it has been rejected, God. Well, what does the Bible have to say about situation ethics? The Bible, of course, has a great deal to say about ethical conduct. We've already you know, read the main passage in the Bible that deals with it and that is later accentuated and, and uh, expounded upon uh, later in the Old Testament and in the New Testament as well. So it's not like the Bible doesn't have anything to say about these matters. It does. And the biblical teaching is totally different from that of Joseph Fletcher. For one thing, 
the biblical view includes specific laws. If God, for example, has prohibited adultery, as he has in Exodus 20, verse 14, and if God hasn't taken that commandment off the table, and he hasn't, according to Romans 13, 9, then committing adultery is a violation of God's express law and is therefore sin under any circumstances. In fact, specifics of Old Testament law are often magnified in the New Testament. For instance, not only is stealing forbidden by the Ten Commandments and the New Testament, but in the New Testament, the believer is also told to work in order to have money and things to give to those in need so he doesn't have to steal. Ephesians 4.28, Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. So that's, that's the part of love that is godly love. I work not just to meet my own needs, but so that I can give to those who have need. It goes without saying that these biblical laws are authoritative. And not only that, the Bible gives guidelines for those situations and circumstances to which specific laws do not speak. There are several such guidelines. First of all, the believer is never to use his liberty in a manner that will hinder the spiritual progress of another believer. You can read about this in detail in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. This guideline concerns actions and activities that have moral value only by virtue of how they affect others, not in and of themselves. The moral value is determined by the effect of the action on others. In the 1 Corinthians 8 uh, instance, the matter was whether or not a believer was at liberty to eat meats that had been sacrificed to idols. Some thought that they could eat uh, such meat, and others thought that they could not. Actually, Paul says that since the sacrificing to the idol was really an invalid transaction, in other words, because idols don't really exist, then it, it was meaningless, it was a meaningless action that they were doing, yet eating the meat would actually make no difference in that situation. But he said not everybody realized that. And some still ate as if, you know, it did have some meaning, like, there was really an idol involved, and, and, and therefore it was a bad thing. So Paul says, for their sakes, we should restrict our liberty. If it bothers them that I eat meat sacrificed to idols, then I won't do it. I won't eat that meat. And this is how agape love serves others. It sacrifices its own freedom instead of insisting on it. Galatians 5.13, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty, liberty, but only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. So that's the first principle. Another principle is that we should act in all situations so as to promote the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10.31, Therefore, whether you eat or drink, or drink or eat or drink, yeah, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. The glory of God is who God is. And thus it means conforming to what he has revealed of himself in his word. So the application of this principle really involves prior knowledge of what God is like and therefore what he would desire in any particular situation. And that knowledge can be acquired with certainty only from the Bible. Another principle is expressed in how we Relate to unbelievers. Colossians 4, 5 says, Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. The purpose of wise actions is to win those outside of Christ to him. What particular course of action this may require in each instance, God reveals to us, the individual believer. The principle is ignored if one doesn't believe that people are lost and need to be won to Christ. Although we acknowledge that there may be differences of opinion as to the specific application of these guidelines, the guidelines themselves, I think, are clear, and they set the bounds for our actions. We might summarize by saying 
that the biblical teaching includes both the law and God's agape love. So let's wrap it up. Situation ethics is clearly one of the great challenges that face our world today. It is part and parcel of the general rebellion, I think, against the authority of God's word that engulfs America. Vast numbers of people are living life and making decisions based upon their own subjective perceptions and personal feelings. For them, the concepts of right and wrong, truth and error are obscure, they're blurred, they're hazy, they're gray, and they're complex. What is wrong in one situation may be right and acceptable in another, they say. Well, Satan has done his job well. He has made great strides in American culture in the last half century in his effort to break down the biblical values and moral absolutes. He has succeeded in replacing this framework with a tolerant, open, permissive attitude and an outlook that refrains from passing judgment on anybody or anything. The I'm okay, you're okay perspective has been embedded firmly into American civilization. Most people no longer feel comfortable with telling a person that adultery is wrong or homosexuality or divorce or abortion. The mantra today is, who am I to judge? But the truth is we don't have to judge. We can let God be the judge. We just need to affirm the truth. The mindset of today's situationist is really nothing new. We humans don't generally regard rules and regulations as positive things. We don't like restrictions. We usually perceive them as infringements on our freedom, deliberate attempts to restrict our behavior and interfere with our happiness. Like children, we may have a tendency to show resentment and a rebellious spirit when we're faced with spiritual requirements. We may feel that God is being arbitrary and, and merely burdening our lives with these haphazard and insignificant restrictions. But God doesn't do that. God would never do that. He has never placed upon anyone any requirement that was inappropriate, unnecessary, or unfair. During the Israelites' first encampment on the plains of Moab, prior to their entrance into Canaan, Moses articulated a, a very important principle. Deuteronomy 6.24 And the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God, and notice, for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is to this day. God would never ask us to do anything that is ultimately and eternally harmful to us. He does not restrict us nor exert his authority over us in order to purposely make us unhappy. Quite the opposite. God knows exactly what will make us happy. And he, here it is. Obeying his word will make a person happy. John 13, 17. If you know these things, blessed are you. That, that's the word for happy. Blessed are you if you do them. Obeying his word will make a person exalted. Also, James 4.10, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. He will exalt you if you obey him. Obeying his word will make a person righteous. 1 John 3.7, little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. And then obeying his word will make a person wise. Matthew 7, 24. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, 
I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. If you want to become wise, then learn to obey his word. The Bible simply does not condone situation ethics. Jesus always admonished people to keep the commandments. He kept God's commands himself perfectly because he did. Because he obeyed God implicitly without fail, he had to endure unbelievable pain and torture and ultimate death. But his end was good because God raised him from the dead and took him back to heaven. See? God doesn't always want to spare us the pain and the discomfort. He doesn't always want to make life easy for us. Yes, we go through periods of time where I think he does uh, allow us that blessing. But just because we are going through difficulty or going through hard times, that doesn't mean that God doesn't want us to. It could mean that he wants us to. To teach us some greater quality like perseverance, patience. Situation ethics looks for the easy way to everything. And, and it assumes that I know what is the best way. It assumes that, you know, when the doctor says, uh, if you carry this baby to term, it's going to make life difficult for you, therefore you should abort this baby. Or, you know, one that I heard recently, uh, we went to the CareNet Pregnancy Center fundraiser uh, this week, and we sat with a, with a couple, the man uh, was from India, and uh, he and his wife got pregnant, and they told her that the baby had a 1% chance of survival because it had this condition that was not, um, you know, it wasn't, wasn't a good condition. And so they should abort the baby. So they, he and the wife prayed about it, and uh, they decided that they were going to have the baby even though it only had a 1% chance of survival in this condition, would make life... Well, she, even if she did survive the, the birth, she would die shortly thereafter. She, they had the baby. The baby had one surgery to correct the problem. And we were sitting with that young girl there, beautiful young girl, living a very normal life, what we, what we sometimes think is going to be the end result. You know, it's just... You take God out of the equation and you can let fear control you. And, and then you can let it drive you to decisions that are not biblical. They're not right. And you can, you can justify it in your, in your head by saying, well, this is what you know, I thought would be the best thing to do. But who knows? I love the, uh, I could go on and on about this and I really should stop, but this is the one instance, the speaker at that night said, this is the one instance where we allow uncertainties to guide our decisions rather than certainties. That's not usually the way we make decisions, right? We study the issue we, we find out what the certainties are. We, we evaluate the risk. And based on the weight of the certainties as opposed to the uncertainties, if the certainties are uh, you know, weighing more than the uncertainties, then we will go toward the certainties, right? But in, in, the, in the event of abortion or any of these other issues, we do it exactly the opposite. We assume that if I have this child then this and that and the other is going to happen. Either life's not going to be good for the child, life isn't going to be good for me, life is going to be hard for me. And so based on those uncertainties, none of those things are certain, right? 
we all know examples of people who thought about having an abortion and they went ahead and had the child and then, you know, God blessed them abundantly. What they feared were the uncertainties they never materialize. Some of the things were hard, sure. Life is hard. No matter what we go through, life is hard. But we don't make our decisions based on the uncertainties. We make them based on the certainties. And that whole, that whole argument fits right into this thing of situation ethics. We cannot, we, we must not, Assume that we have all the information in front of us to make the kind of decision that would allow us to violate one of God's laws and make it, make it okay. Because we know how it will turn out. The ends do not justify the means. God help us to not buy into this lie that has really permeated our culture. It permeates, it's, it's, it's permeated the whole homosexual, gay marriage, transgender, the whole, all that whole thing. How can, you know, when I decide to marry somebody based on love, how can that be wrong? Isn't that situation ethics? Because I decide to marry, I'm a guy and I decide to marry a guy because I love them. How can that be wrong? That's situation ethics. That's what it is. How can it be wrong? Because God says it's wrong. You start thinking about it and you realize, man, there's all kinds of things. In fact, we have all been guilty of this. We have all been guilty. I'm not just pointing the finger at others. We have all been guilty of justifying our actions based on what we thought would be a good end even though... To get there was not, you know, we knew that we were doing something wrong to get there. We've all done that. So, God help us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for clarity. And now, Lord, help us to be obedient to that clarity that we have concerning this issue. And for those that still aren't clear, I pray that you'll help them to take the things that we've talked about and to truthfully consider them and allow them, Lord, to enlighten them and help them to come to the right conclusion about these matters. Help us, Lord. We need your, your spirit. We need your power. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.